it's been pretty quiet on the news front. Of course, outside of Donovan Mitchell being traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers, a move that I don't think anybody foresaw. Me personally, I felt that it was either the Knicks or bust. I remember when I did, when I looked over the NBA um, offseason survey that ESPN ran, I looked over that last week. And one of the questions posited was, where does Donovan Mitchell end up after the trade? I think it was after the trade deadline or what team is Donovan Mitchell on after the trade deadline? And I believe it was 14 to 1 New York. 14 of the 15 people polled predicted him to be traded to New York. I did as well. I thought that it was either New York or nothing. And very clearly, Danny Ainge and the Utah Jazz had a different idea. And this deal is, some people are being very charitable to Danny Ainge and saying that, you know, this deal isn't as bad as some people may think it is. Of course, when you have those two extremes, some people saying that Danny Ainge is literally the worst GM that has ever existed. He got absolutely fucking fleeced. L plus ratio plus RIP bozo, all that shit. And of course, there are also people saying like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. Fortunately, I didn't see anyone saying that the Jazz won the trade, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to get right into it. We're going to listen to our favorite NBA reporter, Mr. Which bombs Wolch. are these? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was a trade that I think even surprised the Knicks today, that Utah and Cleveland had restarted their talks, Scott, uh, really Tuesday morning uh, after our reporting on Monday night that the Knicks were signing R.J. Barrett, uh, and you know, they would have to restart those Donovan Mitchell talks later, but this is one yeah, that lands here right at the start of uh, Labor Day weekend and in a lot of ways sort of marks the end of uh, NBA trade season, I think, is, as we've been following it here uh, from Kevin Durant, which didn't happen to now Donovan Mitchell, which does with him landing with the Cavs. So give me a sense from Tuesday morning till now when you hit send on a tweet, like how how'd Cleveland get in there and make it happen? Kobe Altman, Cleveland's uh, president, was in New York on Monday night. He was watching Serena Williams at the U.S. Open. Uh, saw a reporting on uh, R.J. Barrett signing the extension with the Knicks, and the Knicks and Jazz talks had ended. So he picked up the phone on Tuesday morning. He called Justin Zanuck, the Jazz GM. They restarted a conversation that they'd been having last week, and Cleveland had pulled out on Donovan Mitchell on Friday and even Cleveland thought it was probably going to end up being New York but they got in there and Cleveland and the Jazz had that deal today and Utah never called back to New York to give them a chance to top that Cavaliers offer I think they felt they were negotiating in good faith with Cleveland and they did the deal with Cleveland for the three unprotected first round picks and and some young players the last part of that I find to be particularly interesting in that Utah never reached back out to New York. So it wasn't mentioned in this video, but so the total trade sends uh, Larry Markinen, Colin Sexton, and rookie swing Ochai Agbaji. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but it sent those three players along with three unprotected picks and two pick swaps, which of course is a pretty sizable haul. I mean, five picks in total for Donovan Mitchell seems to be about the going rate considering what Utah got for Rudy Gobert. Sexton then went on to sign a four-year extension in Utah. But the fascinating, the most fascinating part of this deal didn't come out until shortly thereafter. And I believe it was Shams who tweeted that the New York Knicks actually presented the better off. It was RJ Barrett, Mitchell Robinson, Obi Toppin plus picks, which comparatively compare comparatively compared, obviously comparatively to what they got from Cleveland. That is the better deal. That deal is significantly more enticing than what they got. From Cleveland, New York had the assets Utah preferred, and the sides seemed to be inching closer to a trade Sunday night and into Monday. But the Knicks balked on including Quentin Grimes in a trade with RJ to acquire Mitchell. Sources said so. The Knicks' original trade that was set to include RJ, Mitch, and Obi Toppin was, I guess, 
I don't know if it was declined or rescinded, but this must have occurred early on in the process because Mitchell Mitch Robinson later went on to sign an extension with New York, which would have drastically altered the which would have drastically altered the um the basis of the deal because Utah would have had to account for all of that extra salary that they would have been bringing in. More surprisingly than Utah declining that offer from New York was New York even offering that trio of player because for all intents and purposes they seem to love rj barrett i mean they also just went ahead and signed him to an extension uh the same day that the news of donovan mitchell broke the knicks were officially inking rj barrett to a four-year extension i mean mitchell robinson is a great player that would have been as i already mentioned that would have been the best possible deal for donovan mitchell i think because you get the picks granted i think it was a one or two less than what they got from cleveland but you also have a decent core to continue to build around like no disrespect to colin sexton and larry Markin, but that duo is not as good as rj barrett mitchell robinson and obi Toppin. i feel that those three guys give you a more well-rounded base than what you currently have with sexton Marketing. Not to say that I don't like Colin Sexton. I think he's a great player, but I think that ultimately Utah went with the worst deal. Not by much. I don't want to poo-poo. I don't want to poo-poo their acquisition too badly, but most certainly not the best deal they had on the board, clearly. But what everyone really cares about more than that is how does Donovan Mitchell fit on the Cleveland Cavaliers? And this trade blew everybody out of the water literally nuked ESPN because or ESPN and Woj literally nuked NBA Twitter because it was unexpected and this deal makes the Eastern Conference even more frightening and more of a gauntlet than it was before because you look at this Cavaliers team you have Darius Garland you have Jared Allen you have Donovan Mitchell you have Evan Mobley you have Karis LeVert coming off the bench, potentially. You have three All-Stars in your starting lineup, plus Evan Mobley, who is probably going to go on to be an All-Star within the next couple of years. This team is absolutely stacked. And what makes them even scarier is that Donovan Mitchell is a clear upgrade over Colin Sexton, who already seemed to fit quite well alongside Darius Garland because Garland is more of the point guard. You know, everyone was... We were all making jokes about how the Cavs basically have two guys who can't play point guard. They're both like 6'2". They don't have a lot of size. But Darius Garland took that criticism and emerged as a legitimately talented playmaker. And that was with Colin Sexton alongside him. Now he has Donovan Mitchell, who is a more polished scorer in every facet. Um, I mean, there's really nothing I can say about Donovan Mitchell. A dude who averaged 25 points a game, who can give you 30, 35, 40, who can hit the three at a reasonable rate, like 35, 36, 37%, someone who gets the basket, someone who in his own, in his own respect is also a quality playmaker. I mean, he was Utah's de facto facilitator and he does have a above average basketball IQ. And especially with the likes of Jared Allen, with Evan Mobley, just having an additional guy who can break up or who can make the offense a little bit more dynamic and now you have two guards who can penetrate you have two guards who can run pick and roll you have two guards who are capable of making high degree of difficulty passes to free up their guys for easy buckets and i do think that donovan mitchell is going to bolster their defense a little bit um it's of course tough for him to be an elite defender when he has to bear such a sizable offensive load but he has the size, at least in regards to his wingspan, and he's got the athleticism. He's incredibly explosive. I mean, it was just a great, great, great acquisition by Cleveland, who I feel is the clear winner in this deal. But what is even weirder is that Cleveland goes and they are able to acquire Donovan Mitchell. And they make their team markedly better compared to last season. But they are still, like the sixth or seventh best team in the conference i think that is the i think that's the part of this transaction that is kind of getting overlooked 
And it's because, like, again, we're still in shock. It's been almost a week, and we're still in shock that Donovan Mitchell is a Cleveland Cavalier. But when you look at the talent level in the East, I'm taking Boston, Philly, Brooklyn, Milwaukee, and Miami over Cleveland. You do also have the Chicago Bulls, although I don't know. They're probably going to get off to a rocky start because it also came out a few days ago that Lonzo Ball is going to miss uh, the season opener, and he's we don't know really when he's coming back after his um, off-season surgery or whenever the fuck he had the surgery. I can't remember. But fully healthy, I'm taking Chicago over them as well. I mean, the East is just so stacked this year. But also, Cleveland is now a legitimate... I, I'm hesitant to call them a legitimate contender because I do think that they're going to get beat in the second round or maybe even in the first round, depending on what matchup they draw. Because if you're going up against Boston, like that's a team that is absolutely way ahead of Cleveland just in, in every facet. But Cleveland, because they have this talent level, because all of their core players are going to come back a year older with an, you know, an extra year of work put in, anything can happen. I would not be surprised to see them go to the conference finals, nor would I be surprised to see them pull off an upset in the first round because you have such depth in the Eastern Conference. One of the like legitimate contenders, I'm talking like Boston, Milwaukee, Brooklyn, or Philly, one of them is going to go up against Cleveland in the first round. I mean, Miami too. One of those five teams is going to go up against Cleveland. I'm also forgetting about the Atlanta Hawks. I mean, the Atlanta Hawks are a team that is on the same level as Cleveland as well. But you have the five, the five, um, I guess, S-tier teams in the East, whom I just mentioned. One of them is going to go up against Cleveland. And I feel that any of them can get upset by Cleveland because it is the NBA playoffs, and that's not going to be a typical first-round matchup. If you're a one seed, you know, Cleveland could very well be the eighth seed in the East or the seventh seed in the East. You don't know. You also don't know about Charlotte. You don't know what the Hawks are going to look like. You don't know what Chicago is going to look like. So if Boston or Milwaukee or Brooklyn finishes atop the conference and they go ahead and they draw Cleveland in the first round, I mean, we saw how much of a pain in the ass it was for Brooklyn to go up against Cleveland this past year, let alone this revamped version of that team where everybody is healthy. So I don't think Cleveland makes it to the finals yet. You know, they, they are still young and they will be together for the next couple of years. But I mean, there's a reason this trade sent the timeline into a, a, a spiral. And you knew it was legitimately warranted because folks weren't even really cracking jokes about Utah or about the Knicks. And usually whenever any piece of news drops that involves the Knicks losing out on a star player, the Knicks monopolize the conversation. Like the whole timeline is just them, is just the Knicks being shit on. But that wasn't the case with this trade. Everybody was talking about Donovan Mitchell in Cleveland. Everybody was talking about Donovan Mitchell and, Dar and Darius Garland in the backcourt. Everybody was talking about Mitchell, Garland, Allen, Evan Mobley, and rightfully so. This is also just great for the league in general. You can There's nothing wrong with having all of these teams that are super dense with talent and also within, you know, a few games of each other. Even though I don't think Cleveland is a contender, I think that from the first seed to the seventh seed in the East is only going to be separated by four or five games. You're going to have seeding being decided on the final day of on the final day of the regular season, like how it was with the Western Conference a few years ago. Although that was like more towards the bottom this whole year and it's going to start right away. It's going to be so weird to just see how drastically the standings change when each of the premier teams go on a losing streak because they're all going to. There is none, none of these teams are exempt from losing five, six games in a row, especially if the schedule is not, especially if the schedule doesn't favor them. Like imagine if you're Brooklyn and you go on a road trip that has you travel to Boston and then Philly 
and then Cleveland, and then Charlotte, and then Miami, and then Atlanta. Like, you're liable to get beat each of those nights. And that goes for any top team in the East. Like, I'm just glad that this worked out, and one of these teams clearly made out better than the other. But now we have an interesting, another interesting conversation to talk about, and that is what does Utah do from here? And that's a rhetorical question. Everybody knows that Utah is going to, everyone knows that Utah is now going to enter full rebuild mode. I mean, if it wasn't clear from them trading Rudy Gobert, it's clear now because both of their teams are gone. But now Utah is going to look to offload the rest of their uh, veterans, I guess you could call them, on the team. Look at talk about guys like Mike Conley, Jordan Clarkson, and Bojan Bogdanovich. Fortunately, for all three of those guys, I think maybe not at the beginning of the season, but around the trade down. Okay, I found, I found an article. The Utah Jazz are engaged in trade discussions that involve Boyan Bogdanovich, Mike Conley, and Jordan Clarkson. Sources told The Athletics, Tony Jones, Utah traded three-time All-Star Donovan Mitchell on Thursday to the Cavs. The Jazz entered a complete rebuild after moving Mitchell and trading Rudy Gobert to Minnesota. The Lakers are interested in Bogdanovich, Conley, and Clarkson, but want to preserve cap space for next offseason. That was reportedly due to them wanting to go after Kyrie Irving there's the hope that they can lure him from Brooklyn to LA um, by way of a max contract and as we know Kyrie did not sign a long-term extension quite yet he picked up his player option but that's ultimately the Lakers plan Utah currently has 17 guaranteed contracts Conley and Bogdanovich at about 23 million and 20 million have the two highest salaries on the Jazz Clarkson is slated to make 13 million during this season. All three of these guys get moved. 100%. I don't know when. I don't know where. But none of them will be on the Utah Jazz after the trade deadline. I'm looking at a team like Miami. Miami is someone who could definitely benefit from a little bit more scoring off the bench. I.e. somebody like Jordan Clarkson. I mean, you also can't ha you cannot have enough three-point shooters on any team. So... Boyan Bogdanovich, I mean, maybe he goes to the Clippers or somebody. I mean, maybe one of them gets traded to Denver or to Dallas, another team who could benefit from a little bit more spacing, especially after losing Jalen Brunson. Just a guy like Jordan Clarkson to come off the bench or maybe even start and be a secondary ball handler alongside Luka Doncic. I also would not be upset if Brooklyn found a way to bring Boyan Bogdanovich back back to the Nets. I loved him during his tenure here, albeit it was rather short, but he's also a super productive player in his own right. Again, a guy who can hit 38, 40% of his threes will have no problem finding work in today's NBA. And also, keep in mind that they might not even have to hit the trading block. They might get bought out. They might get bought out closer to the postseason. That's a huge thing that bad teams do with their veterans so that way they can go and join a playoff team I think Wesley Matthews did that a few years ago and that allowed him to sign with the Milwaukee Bucks like this isn't that's not a foreign thing and that is also quite possible as well especially because like Utah already made out quite well in both of their deals for Gobert and Mitchell I mean they have a shitload of assets Granted, I don't know how useful those draft picks are going to be. Another huge talking point in regards to the Knicks offer was that one would speculate that the Knicks draft picks, the Knicks draft picks would be better than Cleveland's. Um, probably not by much. I mean, the, even if Mitchell got sent to the Knicks, they're still, I don't know, mid first round, late first round. But. Like, we're, we're, we're splitting hair, hairs at this point. It's not going to be lottery picks regardless. You're looking at guys, you know, in the 20s, 25, 27 area. Maybe a little higher, but ultimately, again, we're splitting hairs. But overall, if I had to grade the deal, I feel comfortable giving Cleveland... I think I have to give Cleveland 
an A. I don't want to give them an A+. Plus. I don't believe in A+. Pluses, but they, they knocked it out of the park. They added a all-NBA caliber player. And yes, they gave up a handful of picks, but how useful are those picks going to be to them anyway? And then also, they didn't have to give up really any of their core pieces. Like, they still have Darius Garland. They still have Evan Mobley. They still have Jared Allen. I mean, you could argue that Colin Sexton was part of the core, but he was the le- he was the most expendable member of the core, and then Lowry Markkinen was kind of just falling out of... Uh, his time in Cleveland was coming to an end regardless. I mean, I just don't know if he's if he was fit to play there. So an easy A- minus at least for Cleveland. For Utah, it gets a little squirrely. I don't want to be too critical of them because it's certainly not the worst deal in the world. I mean, any trade that you can swing where you get five picks, great. Obviously, three three picks outright and then two swaps. So when you can get five spots in the draft, great deal. Great deal. The players, especially compared to what they missed out on with the Knicks, it's definitely clouds our judgment a little bit. But then again, it also comes down to your philosophy and how you would rather build a team. Would you rather build a team through the draft or... Would you rather build it through trades? Because Utah going with Cleveland proves that they would rather have the draft capital because also you can use those picks to leverage another trade. Granted, I don't know how easily that's going to happen. I mean, they could throw a pick in with Mike Conley's contract just to sweeten the deal a little bit because, of course, he is getting older and he's not the player he once was. He's not the all-defensive team guy that he used to be. But I think, you know, a C-plus to a B minus is an appropriate trade or is an appropriate grade because it's about what you would expect for Donovan Mitchell. Like they got fair market value for their star player. So can't really argue with um. I can't really, you know, I can't talk too much shit. I definitely could talk more, but that's not really, that's not really what I'm trying to do 